my, uh, my favourite episode was when we accidentally released a version of the Glasgow Haskell compiler with the unfortunate property that under some admittedly slightly obscure circumstances, if it found a type error in your program, it would report the type error and delete the source code. <laughs> Bad programmer. I don't want to see that program again. <laughs> and I'm going to make sure I don't too. So you would think that what would happen is we would be buried in mail saying, you bastard, you deleted my source code. But what happened? We just heard some mild-mannered uh, sort of email across the Haskell mailing list saying, by the way, I've made this script that goes CP-R to move my source code to a fresh place before I compile. And then everything's fine. No. And you know, by the way, GHC developers, you might like to know so you can fix it for next time. <laughs> now, those are the users that I like. You know, they're, they're, also, they're a bit geeky, but they're, they're very friendly. It's, it's some of the, something that people notice on the Haskell mailing list is that they're very friendly. And this kind of user base makes Haskell quite nimble. Uh, another, another property of these users is that if you implement a new feature, perhaps like somehow slightly being, breaking backward compatibility, do they bl um, bitch about the, uh, the lack of backward compatibility? No, no, no. They're like hyenas with red meat. They just fall upon the new feature and start to use it. They complain that it doesn't work, of course, but <laughs> that's a problem I don't mind. So my motto is here, avoid over success at all costs. Right? You, want, you don't want to have too many users because they start to tie you down. However, Haskell has, perhaps unfortunately, become quite useful over this time. Right? So, and it is, it is, so it's grown um, uh, increasingly important libraries, and there's a whole bit about that in, in the paper. Um, increasingly important foreign function interface, and an increasing array of, um, of features to do with concurrency and asynchronous exception and transactional memory and data parallelism, all kinds of things that are enormous fun, but together they make the language large and complicated. So uh, we undoubtedly are beginning to pay the price of usefulness. And, he, and I, think it's, I, I think pretty much any really useful language begins to pay this price after a while. So I should wrap up. I think, I think Haskell doesn't really meet Biana's uh, criterion that uh, a language to succeed must be, good, must be good enough on all axes. Haskell, in effect, pursues an alternative plan that says, let's be really good on, on, on one or two axes. Let's have, take a few beautiful ideas and pursue them relentlessly and see where they take us. Not because that is the only way to write programs, because, but, but because it's an interesting way to write programs, and it's a fun way to write programs. Um, and uh, so if you like, in the end, it's not so much that we want you to write Haskell programs. We want to infect, to use a rather invasive analogy, infect your brains rather than your, your hard drives. It's the, the marketplace of ideas that, uh, that David was describing earlier. So I think that... Um, uh, thinking back, I was trying to think uh, what, you know, what does make languages succeed, and I think luck play, does play an important part, right? So um, uh, technical excellence in a language design is clearly um, uh, desirable, but it is plainly neither necessary nor sufficient. Sadly, not necessary, and uh, perhaps also sadly not sufficient to succeed. Um, on the other hand, luck really is definitely necessary, and I think we had our, our slice of luck. This, uh, this moment when we all came together with similar goals and a, and a, and a level of trust is not easy to reproduce. Um, and indeed, there's a process going on at the moment to, to uh, uh, make a, a, a sort of new version of Haskell 98, for, um, which, is, which, is, which is working more slowly, partly because um, the, the particular combination of circumstances and ca cannot be just conjured up by wishing that it could. I also want to finish just by saying that uh, Haskell is great fun. It's rich enough to be useful, but the thing that I think is really important about it is that it's a kind of playful language, and it encourages people who, who want to play. And so I've given some examples here about uh, the sort of playing that people do embedded domain-specific language and cunning type programs, but it's a language in which it's fun to write programming pearls, in which people really do start to do bits of programming as an art form, write papers about them, and even get them published. And I think this is good, not just because it's fun, but also because play leads in the end to, uh, to new discoveries. So I think languages that are playful uh, lead us on, on, on to, to, to learning new things. Uh, so that's really all I have to say. I'm going to finish just by putting up a slide with the, uh, the names of the Haskell Committee, because I've not mentioned uh, uh, by, by any means all of them by name, but they deserve all of your uh, appreciation for the hard work that they put into this language. Thanks very much. Answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, uh, David Unger, IBM again, and I know I'm up here a lot, but I'm just enjoying this so much, and everything stimulates thought. I've got to go learn Haskell now for sure. Ah, so good on you. <laughs> so here's my question: As I understand it, there's this triple of values, types that describe values, and perhaps type classes that somehow describe types. And every time I hear a number like that, I wonder, you know, is there a fourth, is there an infinite number, is that a problem, is that cool, should there only be one thing, two things, uh, what can you say about this? Mm, mm. <laughs> no, there are really only three. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Why? Well, so Simon mentioned system F, there's this thing called system F omega, which um, goes back to Girard and others that, in fact, has this infinite hierarchy. And it's been around for a while, and people have played around going up. You never get higher than three. You have values, types, and kinds, and people never really need to go higher than that. So it's three because no use has yet been discovered for number four. Right. It's also known how to go up infinitely high if you want to, but people tend not to. OK. We have found applications when it's useful to abstract over a class. So rather than having a particular class, to be able to abstract over classes, but they're, they're, they're somewhat geeky applications. So is that I number show four? You an example. I'm not sure whether it is. It just seemed relevant thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's number four. John says it's number four. No, it's still three. <laughs> it's still three. <laughs> Let's have another question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Time to move on. <laughs> So, uh, Andrew Black, uh, Portland State University. Um, we have, in, in Emerald, you can have object constructors, and you can have object constructors inside object constructors, and you can have object constructors inside object constructors, as many levels deep as you like. But we never found a use for more than three. Huh. Any comments? <laughs> No, I think that was a very good comment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the, ob the object constructors look like just record construction to me. So, um, well, well, yeah, in yeah. a sense, they are. But yeah. we've ne we we ha the reason you nest them is to get parameterization, right. and we had we never found a need for more than three. My name is Paul McJones, currently with Adobe. Um, I worked with John Backus in 1974-75 on RED, and I think the monads that you have are, are a very good solution, a very interesting solution to one of the problems we had then, I.O., or the lack thereof. The other thing was, in those days, John was extremely, I think this probably persisted, against any kind of variables, bound variables, lambda variables and variable-free programming was, was a term he often used. I'm wondering if you guys ever got a chance to, you know, to, to talk to him you know, and, and show him your style of programming, which, which uses variables in a way that, that seems pretty controlled to me. I was just. Uh, yeah, so, so um, uh, if I, if I um, respond to that, that briefly. So I've, um, I uh, studied this variable-free style um, programming and discovered that I was getting myself tied in knots doing indirect plumbing. Um, and just n saying, I want to name the variable that I'm using seemed to be so much easier. So, um, in, e in effect, I mean, <laughs> so, so I think maybe he wasn't, he wasn't so right about that. He was wrong. <laughs> about, but um, uh, in ed educational, though, it was. And, and so, um, and we talked, I mean, John Williams took that work quite a lot further subsequently, didn't he? Do you want, do you want to add anything to that? So, I had the good fortune to be a visiting researcher in John Backus's group in 87. And we had many uh, very uh, interesting discussions, not so much about variable freedom, uh, more about lazy evaluation. Um, he was very interested to know whether or not the next version of FP would benefit from being lazy. Um, but variable free programming is, is popular among some Haskell users. And in fact, there's even a bot on the Haskell IRC channel that will take uh, novice programmers' pieces of code and translate them into variable free code which, unfortunately, nobody then understands. <laughs> but it's certainly a fun exercise, which is still enjoyed. OK, thanks very much. W just one last observation. Um, another person who was young at the time, younger, and influenced by John's paper was Alex Stepanov, who went on eventually to do imperative functional programming or something in the STL. Ben Zorn, Microsoft Research. So one of the inspirations for you 